Okay, thank you. I'm sorry I can't be there. So I'm going to tell you about a project we started uh, some 10 years ago, which is to develop a fast, fine-grained, parallel density functional code. And there's been a wide range of collaborators um, inside and outside my group and Sanjay's group, and we're grateful for the funding from NSF, IBM, Ornal, etc. Um, we're interested primarily in understanding complex heterogeneous systems. So through the work with NAMD, you're familiar with uh, biological systems such as the protein on the upper left, but they can undergo reactions and there's a blue cloud of electron density where reactive chemistry would happen. We're interested in device physics where there's a combination of complex materials that make up the devices. And we're interested in simpler biomimetic systems where we can learn about the interactions. Now, we're interested in doing this with the electrons in order to provide chemistry, to provide materials, science beyond simpler force fields that you're familiar with from the NAMD project. So there are some limitations. Um, we're, list, we're limited to much smaller system sizes, although as machines get bigger, that, that increases. We're limited to short time dynamics. But parallel scaling, as well as faster algorithms, is one way around some of these difficulties. So in this talk, I'll just tell you a little bit about some of the parallelization we've done. And if I have time at the end, I'll briefly discuss one application. So what we're going to use is density functional theory in the Cohen-Sham formulation. In principle, this is exact. There's a theorem that states the energy can be written as a functional of the electron density, except we don't know the functional. So we make various approximations. Um, we write the functional as the kinetic energy of non-interacting electrons, quantum kinetic energy. The Hartree energy, which treats the electron density just as a classical charge distribution and interaction of the electrons with the uh, charge density, a non-local term that gets rid of unwanted electrons, and some magic exchange correlation functional that contains all the sins, which is unknown. So if we think of just water, water has eight electrons, but two of them we'd like to get rid of, and we remove them by introducing a non-local electron ion interaction. And then we put in the electrons we want, the valence electrons, which I'm sorry, there are eight, so two per orbital, as you see here, and we get rid of the two in the core. So what we use is a plane wave basis set. So plane wave basis sets are very powerful, and they're powerful because you can use FFTs. So the states in real space are related by an FFT to the states in G space, and the electron density is also related by a Fourier sum. So just to give you an idea of the scaling, the number of states or orbitals goes like the number of atoms, so do the number of points in G space, and so do the number of electrons. So a plane wave basis set looks as follows. You have, because the density is the square of the wave functions summed, it is twice as big, has twice as big a radius in g-space. So you have a rather small spherical region in g-space and a larger, twice as large a radius for the, to describe the electron density. And we can also Fourier transform that on a discrete mesh into real space and it turns out, if I add these things up, point by point in real space and transform back due to a sampling theory, that's an exact calculation of the Fourier representation of the electron density. So that's a very nice relationship, and it makes plane wave-based density functional theory very fast. So basically what we do in the simple scalar picture, we start with the states. There's n squared memory, n squared log n computation. We Fourier transform them into real space. We calculate the charge density by squaring them. We do a sum reduction 
And that sum reduction takes n squared memory to n points. <coughs> and then we do all the calculations on basically the exchange correlation functional and n log n operations. In com conjunction with the non-local component of the forces, which I don't have time to get into, we can compute a derivative of the functional with respect to the coefficients on the electrons, which gives us forces we can move by a conjugate gradient procedure. And then we can normalize. Orthonormality costs n cubed, and we increase the memory in order to uh, achieve higher scalability. So the memory penalty is a little higher than uh, n squared. So this is a flow chart. And all the FFTs in the top middle have to do with performing the operations to pr produce the electron, the states in real space, square them, and then sum. The non-local matrix computations, those are also involving n squared FFTs. And then you see the order n on the right work on the density. It all comes back in to give us forces on the plane wave coefficients. We move them, and then we have to orthonormalize them. So parallelization under charm plus plus, which this grant will give a lot of improvement to. We simply take uh, the states in real space and, and G space. We parallelize real space by, by planes, G space by points. And that involves one transpose operation to do. And then we sum in square. We do our reduction from n squared points to n. We're able to do our n log n work, which we parallelize by lines in the FFT language, and do a few transposes back and forth. And then we can do a sum reduction, or a multi, in this case, a multicast back. So n things go to n squared objects by making n copies of the n data. We can move the electrons, and then we can do an n-squared operation in something called the pair calculator in order to perform the orthogonality constraint. So the challenge is we have multiple concurrent FFTs to generate the states in real space. We have our sum reduction to the density in real space. Once we've done the density work, we have to take those n data points and send them back to the states. That makes n copies to make n squared data and apply the orthogonality constraint. So the scaling bottlenecks that you normally have due to non-local and local electron ion interactions we removed by the use of new methods that we've previously published. Now, one of the great uh, triumphs of this was with uh, was with Eric and um, and Ram, and um, they wrote a wonderful paper where they took our data structures and parallelized them on a 3D torus to minimize the communication in the way that's described with the size of the objects that is described on the on the slide. So this was very nice. It won a distinguished paper award in 2009. And we are happy to have, uh, we are very pleased to have more funding to, to do some more. Now, let's see what all this hard work gained us. So on the left, you see a 256 electron simulation without topological aware mapping. You can see how the, uh, the work spreads out, particularly in the transpose from G to real. And with topological aware mapping, we save a factor of two in CPU time. Now, part of this is to worry about topologically aware spanning trees and to improve the, uh, the aggregate bandwidth. And so um, that was really very important for this project to get that done. So if we look at some of these numbers, even something as small as uh, water 32 by the time I've got it on 2,000 processors, it, it runs about as fast as 32 of the kind of waters that you would get in, uh, that you would be able to run in NAMD, albeit on one processor. But still, it has all the electrons and it can do 
chemistry. And this is part of work that again appeared in 2009. So the summary is we have fine-grained parallelization of uh, the ab initio MD method with a number of processors really 20 to 30 times greater than the number of electronic states. And that allowed us to do long-time simulations of small systems. So I see I have a minute left, so I will spare you the applications. But um, if anyone's interested, you know, you have the slides and I can talk about them. Thank you so much. And so we're on the slide, piezoelectrically piezo driven phase change memory would be fast, cool, which is mean it wouldn't give off much heat and scalable. So what we need in the memory is a material which has two states, a low resistance state and a high resistance state, and some a way to apply a physical field such as pressure in this case or heat in others to change the state. So can we find a suitable material that can be switched by pressure using a combined experimental theoretical approach? So the typical material is germanium antimony tellurium in chemical ratio 225. So in the crystal it is actually an insulator, it has a band gap. But if I turn it into an amorphous material, it becomes conducting. So I can measure inside my memory device whether I'm in the high resistance state or a low resistance state. The problem is if I apply pressure to this material, the process isn't reversible. And for a memory, I need to be able to switch between 1 and 0, depending on the, the input on the right state. The next slide, we looked at a material which is uh, an antimony tellurium, I'm uh, sorry, an antimony uh, germanium alloy which undergoes an amorphous to crystalline transformation under pressure. And then we can reverse, can we reverse that process? So on the next slide, we've mapped out a spinodal spin diagram, space diagram where Yes, we can. So if we apply negative pressure, we hit the spinodal and the material decomposes into an amorphous form. On the next slide, there's a movie where you can see the atoms moving and slowly uh, expanding and the material becoming amorphous. which undergoes an amorphous crystalline. So that is, in fact, a very nice demonstration of... Uh, spinodal de decomposition and a tensile load. And we showed that on the next slide the solid is stable and ambient pressure so we're very happy with that result because by applying pressure or applying tensile load inside our device we can make our two states switch between one and the other with very low voltage. So although we have changed materials in the design this has led to the DARPA project with different materials and different design, and the scientific work has appeared in PNAS. And I want to thank everybody for their time, and I apologize again that uh, I couldn't be there in person, but I will be there for the tutorial. Thank you.